Today we're exploring the Make Noise Zero Coast. It's a semi-modular synthesizer with pre-normaled connections, meaning that you don't have to connect any cables besides an output and potentially a MIDI input for MIDI keyboard or notes. It is monophonic, so that means it offers one note at a time. There are two main oscillators with additional oscillators as well when you get into self-patching. So the setup that I have here, I have the no coast as the main sound source. I have the digitone controlling the MIDI notes gate, velocity, as well as some CC information, which I'll get into in a second. Then I have a small rack up top, which is adding basically a little bit of grit, uh, a little bit of volume, as well as some reverb. So on the surface, you've got the no coast, which is a single voice modular system, basically. It's broken up into different sections to make things easier for routing. Uh, a lot of these connections are normal, meaning that they are connected internally. Um, you can break these connections, some of them. You can also add new connections on top of the normal connections to really expand your synthesizer and, and sounds possible. It's sort of a really good entry point into modular. Once you sort of understand how the no-coast works, you can you know, like obviously use it in a system or you can upgrade to something more, which offers more voices, more modulation, you know, just additional. Um, but for now, we'll focus on how the pre-normaled routing works. Right, so I've got the MIDI input from Digitone which I'm sending notes, gates, velocity, you know, normal MIDI information that you get from a keyboard, synth, uh, sequencer, or some other device. Um, there are some MIDI settings that the NoCoast takes in that you can configure using a combination of these two buttons. However, uh, it's a little complicated to go into, an, into a video. I recommend Make Noises video and the manual um, into what these options do, basically, but uh, as a sort of a general entry point, they allow you to change how the MIDI A and B uh, CV and gate works, as well as uh, what you can do for MIDI channels and as an arpeggiator and other settings. So right now I've got four encoders here mapped to different CCs. Uh, the first one is Glide, which you're hearing sort of that legato glide um, going on between the notes. Uh, then there's two dedicated to the arpeggiator. So there's the arpeggiator on, as well as a latching, and then there's the responding to MIDI clock. So if I turn that off, then it's no longer responding to the MIDI clock set on the digitone. All right, so like I said, check the manual. There's also a printed uh, sticker on the bottom of this unit that outlines the MIDI menu and the different options that you have. Uh, just as a note, I did change one of the default settings uh, normally the MIDI B sends gates upon velocity. Here I'm just sending gates generally, uh, just to make things a little easier. So we're just going to set the arpeggiator to latching here as we explore sort of the routing. Turn the reverb down, actually. All right, so by default, we've had the MIDI settings, which are basically affecting like they normally would on a normal synthesizer. They're affecting the pitch 
and the envelope. Right, on the no-coast, these are broken up into two different sections. So I'll start from the left and move our way to the right. Uh, so I mentioned there's some MIDI settings, which we could check out in the manual. Uh, there's two outputs here. There's the MIDI CV and the MIDI gate. Basically, it gives you two copies of what the no-coast is receiving via the MIDI in. So you can send, uh, for instance, if you're pressing like C5 on your um, keyboard, you can also send C5 over CV to some other um, synth or some other um, device that accepts CV in for volt per octave. Uh, you can also send gate signals, which is, you know, or gates or velocity uh, through this CV output. So it gives you basically a, uh, a CV copy of the MIDI information. So it's a mini CV, uh, MIDI to CV module in this left section. All right, so next we have sort of a, a good utility section. We have clock. Uh, so there's a number of ways we can get clock information. There's uh, a tap tempo. There's a tempo input uh, that accepts CV. Uh, there's a clock output, which will relay the clock information that's being fed in. Um, and in terms of clock settings, it's either MIDI, tap, or CV input. So right now I'm getting MIDI, MIDI clock in. I can turn that off and then tap. MIDI clock will override CV if you have the MIDI input. The clock basically sets um, the internal clock for the device. And the main function that it has is controlling the speed of the clocked random output. Uh, so this is a CV random output. Um, and it's going to function like any other random. It's just it's a true random. It, it spans the whole distribution. Uh, it's useful for things like uh, things you want to modulate um, you know, sporadically. And then you can use that in combination with the mixer section below. So there's two inputs. One of them has an attenuverter. We'll, get, we'll go over that in a second. And it has two copies of an output. It has this little window that shows you what's going on with that output. So red is negative, green is positive, and you could that you could see the dimmer you are, the less signal it's actually passing through. So attenuverter. So it's, some, it's a very useful tool to have at your disposal. Basically, it's a uh, it's a way to diminish incoming CV. So that way it only, um, so attenuation. It's a way to take a CV signal down from 100% down to some smaller amount useful for something like a clocked random. And inversion is where you invert the signal from positive to negative or negative to positive. So it gives you both options. Uh, the left input is unattenuated, so it's just the full whatever CV is coming in is going to be spit out at the output plus whatever's mixed with the attenuverter. Then we get to the oscillator section, which is where the sound is coming from. We've got two outputs. We've got a triangle out and a square out. The fundamental frequency for the oscillator is the triangle wave. All right, so that gives you the, the base, right? So triangle is your base. There's a square wave. We'll get into the sort of the audio routing in a second. I'm just going through each section. Um, but basically, you can combine these waves with some harmonics to create um, interesting additive sort of uh, oscillator sounds. Then there's two pitch knobs. There's the coarse setting. And there's a fine, which allows you to adjust within um, some amount of range around that course setting. Then we've got a uh, attenuator for a linear FM input. So you can send input into this. It will, it will FM the oscillator and cause modulations on top of that. And then you can set how much that applies. So zero uh, uh, counterclockwise is off and clockwise is full signal. Right, there's no inversion with an attenuator on this 
And then there's a voltage per octave input uh, that you can use for sending things like uh, pitch CV, uh, a random source, something like that. The next section is where we add overtones and uh, multiply circuits. So they work in tandem. Um, something to note is the gold connections that you see on the panel are the normal connections that are always present. Again, you can break some of these. Um, and I'll, I'll point out sections where you could. Um, but basically, it shows you the routing by default if you don't have anything plugged in. So as you can see here, the, uh, the square wave goes out into the overtone circuit. Then the overtone hits the multiply, and the multiply comes back up and goes out. All right, so this has something to do with overtones and adding harmonics to your oscillator sound. Right, so if you notice, if I adjust these two knobs, it's not going to do anything. That's because that the oscillator section works uh, further down. There's a mix between the fundamental frequency and the overtones. So I'm going to turn that up briefly. I'll explain it in, in a bit. So now I'm at half mix between triangle and harmonics. Right, so it's a much more harmonically rich sound to work with. And we'll get into the, how that works uh, right now, actually. So the overtone basically adds additional harmonics to the sound, and multiply applies the multiplication on top of that to add even more uh, complexity into the oscillator. Uh, the overtone has an input with an attenuator. Again, same as the linear FM. There's no inversion. It's just strictly you know, zero to some amount of voltage. The multiply has an attenuverter, just like the uh, second input of the mixer does. And what's interesting is that the next section is normal to the input of the multiply. So we're going to hear that. I'm going to turn back up the balance, the mix, and I'm going to now bring in the slope. <laughs> Right, so because the slope output is normal to the multiply, you're going to get that modulation without having to patch anything. You can break this connection by plugging a dummy cable into the multiply input, and that'll stop the slope modulation from automatically affecting it. All right, so let's talk about the slope. So the slope is a two-stage envelope, or LFO. You have a attack and a decay called rise and fall, as well as a variable response knob, which goes from log to linear to exponential, also with a number of inputs and outputs. Since we're not plugging anything into the slope, we have to cycle it to create an LFO out of that single, out of that two-stage envelope. So in terms of the variable response, uh, the logarithm side is going to be slower. Right? It's going to take a longer time to decay. The linear is going to be like a normal like straight lines. And then exponential is going to be the fastest. It's going to be like little blips, little, little small transients of modulation happening. On top of that, the ri rise and fall parameters allow you to go into audio rate when you are cycling the envelope. 
we saw there, there is actually some tuning you can do to sync up the oscillator and the slope LFO, the, the audio rate LFO, uh, so that you can get some paraphony um, in the output. All right, so even though it's just a monophonic voice, you can sort of fake additional voices with the slope and contour circuits. In terms of inputs and outputs, we have a time input, which affects both the attack and decay, rise and fall at the same time. This is useful for playing the slope, quote unquote, um, and for sort of tuning it to whatever your main frequency that you're playing is, right? Whatever note you're playing on the keyboard. There's a trig input, which is used when you're not cycling the LFO. This will trigger the envelope to begin. And there's two outputs. There's an end of cycle, which triggers when the um, envelope has finished or the LFO cycle is done and it's repeating. And then there's a slope output, which uh, tracks the, uh, the actual shape of the envelope or LFO. Right, and... Um, the end of cycle is indicated by this yellow LED here. If we turn on cycle and we turn it to a slower um, slower rate, we can see the end of cycle starting to trigger. When we turn it off, it goes full yellow, indicating that we're going to have a full gate signal of 1 at that particular point. The next section is a contour envelope, which is a, it's, it's a four-stage ADSR with combined decay and release controls. So there's an onset or attack. There's a sustain stage, decay release, as well as a, a variable response, similar to the slope circuit. It's got logarithmic, linear to exponential. Um, so again, counterclockwise is going to be slower. Exponential is going to be faster. So the contour is sort of like a traditional subtractive synthesizer. Um, envelope. So the normal connection takes the MIDI gate into the contour gate input. So whenever you press a note, it's going to trigger the envelope to begin and then take whatever shape uh, you set here. And then the normal output is that the contour is going to go into the dynamic section, which is the final section of the audio routing, and trigger what's called a low-pass gate. Uh, so it's a sort of combination VCA and low-pass filter, which will open when a gate signal opens it up at some dynamic level. It'll also do some subtle filtering um, if you turn down the dynamic. So if you've got a lot of harmonically rich content in your oscillator, you can sort of take some of that away by applying a low-pass filter to it. So it's a very handy, uh, simple circuit that we can use at the end point. Um, going back for a second, I mentioned the balance before. That's part of the final section, so it mixes between the fundamental frequency and the uh, harmonics or overtones. What's useful here is that there is actually a external input um, that accepts modular level or line level with some preamp. If you you ha basically have to boost the signal to get it to the right levels, but um, you can self patch and make that easier. Basically, you can mix between some input and some harmonics of that input, so you can use it as sort of an effects engine at that point, like for a guitar or some other synth or, or modular unit. Um, it has a balance input to affect the mix, basically. And then finally, we have the dynamic dynamics, which we just talked about. It's got a, um, um, it's got a knob which controls the filter cutoff, basically. And then there's a line output, which is your only stereo output on the note coast. So I've got the splitter cable. And it's got a little uh, adjustment here for the headphone level, as well as uh, a dynamic input, which again is normal to the contour, and a dynamic output, which relays the similar information as the line output does, but at a modular level. So you don't want to use this for headphones. Backing up briefly, because I realized I forgot to talk about it, um, there are two inputs on the contour. There's a gate input, which I mentioned is defaulted normal to the MIDI gate, as well as a decay input, which affects the amount of decay, and then an end of note. Uh, so if we press a note, we can see that the end of the note has happened, and that's going to send a gate signal, right? which is different from the contour. So similarly, end of cycle, end of note are going to be gate signals, 
when you're doing a normal envelope, and slope and contour are going to be actual shapes of modulation. Uh, the exception is when you're cycling the slope, the end of cycle can be used to output the audio of whatever oscillator you're 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 making with that L, with that uh, audio rate LFO. Okay, that's a lot of information. I'm going to pause the talking and start playing around, basically, um, and I'll go into some patches and some more explanations in a bit. Thanks.
Let me try to explain what I went through there. Um, so I'll try to go over all the connections that I made. Um, it's not really, there's no really reason why I made them. I had some intention of, of some patches I would I would do for this video. Um, it really started with the idea of using two envelopes to affect the dynamics low pass gate circuit. So normally, it's just the contour. But if we also add in the slope circuit when we cycle it, we can get this sort of like, um, almost like uh, dual sort of delay-ish, uh, sort of glitchy um, gate input. Uh, so what I have is the contour going into the unattenuated out. Originally, I had flipped them. And the slope going into the att uh, attenuated input and then basically sending both of, uh, sending one of the signals to the dynamic input, and the other eventually I sent to the overtone circuit. So both the harmonics and the uh, gate were being opened at the same time, which increased the frequency spectrum that was being played, basically. Um, other things that I added were the linear FM modulation from the triangle output, as well as playing the slope with the square wave output going into the time input of the uh, cycled slope. 
and then I'm sending the end of cycle to the external input. Again, when you have cycled the alpha, it becomes an oscillator. So you can send it to the external input to then mix with your additional harmonics. Um, let's see. And then the last thing I added, I added two last things. One was a random, clocked random wave of the decay. Right, so this is basically increasing or decreasing the delay a little uh, decay a little bit around the settings that I had initially set it at. So it would either increase the contour or decrease it, which was also combining with the slope contour to affect the dynamics. And then lastly, um, I wanted additional modulation on the multiply input. So by default, it's normal from the slope. So I added the end of note from the contour going into the multiply and affected that. And then when you start messing with the balance, uh, the overtones, and the setting of the slope, you can get a lot of different sounds. You, can, you, can, you heard that I was trying to match the pitch of the arpeggiator coming in. I was trying to uh, adjust it in the way and then sort of um, try to find a nice mix between the harmonically rich stuff and the sort of lower in the mix uh, oscillations. But overall, it just makes a really interesting patch environment to work with because everything's sort of very easily laid out for you to explore. Um, yeah, this this one is really cool. I, I like this patch a lot. All right, so the next thing I want to do, I sort of combined actually two or three different ideas into this one patch, which is probably good. It keeps the video shorter. Um, basically, it, it combines the two, two ideas. One is the combination of the two envelopes going into the dy dynamics and then playing the slope, and then harmonizing it with the initial pitches. Right? So that's done with this sort of tri triangle set up here. All right, so this one I'll, I'll explain as I go. Um, the other one was more exploration. This one maybe needs a little more explanation. So the first thing I'll do is we need some way to open up the gate. Right? Since we're not playing any MIDI notes, we get, we're, we're sort of, we have to use something at our disposal. So we have a couple options. We can use the clock output to clock the gate. We can use the slope to clock the gate from the end of cycle or the slope. We can use, let me just double check. We can use the square wave. We can use the triangle wave. So we have a number of options. Basically, we want to make this open. We can also affect the dynamics directly. So if we go through the contour circuit, then we're basically using the ADSR to shape the gate signal. If we go directly into the dynamics, right, a good way to test this is with the mixer output with no inputs. We can see how the gate responds, right? Positive. We need a positive signal going into that dynamic to open up the low pass gate. So we're going to do the, uh, the clock. We're going to use the contour envelope. I'll actually turn to the dynamics while we're setting this up. Basically, this is going to be open. And then I'm going to adjust it to some envelope that I, that I like. Then the next step is to take the clock random and go into the attenuated input because we want to be able to adjust the random. We don't want a lot of random. We want a little bit of random. So we're going to set it to, in this case, since my pitch is all the way down on the, the main oscillator, I'm going to turn this positive but small. See, we don't, we don't want it that bright. We want it smaller. Then we're going to send that into the volt per octave input. And here's what we get. Let's expand on that idea. So that's basically what's called a Krell patch, where you're using some random voltage to affect the pitch, and then you're opening up a gate with some clock signal. 
We can expand on this, of course, to make it more interesting. adjust the we want to adjust the pitch we're going to change the attenuverter sort of like these like stringy sounds kind of these weird little blips popping up and that's because the, the random is hopping around a lot of different voltages here in the input it's also being affected by fm we've got some harmonics going on we've got the square wave going to the external input so that's now the fundamental it, there's a lot sort of going into what's making these sounds Something to note that I didn't mention in the normal section, um, we see that there's this gold line going from the slope into the overtone circuit. So when you're when you're at fully clockwise overtone at this sort of double explanation point, the slope actually goes into the overtone as well. So it adds another layer. Uh, it's really effective when you've got the uh, it using as a as an oscillator uh, as a clocked LFO that you're playing with some pitch. So that's a, another sort of added step to the uh, normal audio. So, so remember, we were using the clock to gate the envelope. So when we take out that connection, we lose sound because now it's no, there's no longer any source telling the envelope to open up and do its thing. The pitches are still being affected, but they're just not being transmitted through the rest of the uh, uh, synthesizer. This one I took notes for because it's something I found earlier. I didn't want to lose it. I, I wrote it down. They, there's some patch sheets um, in the manual as well as online, so you can sort of jot these down as you go. Uh, basically, what this creates is a variety of percussive sounds that you can use for... Um, I recommend sampling into something. I actually am starting to make a reel on Morphogene, which has the different sounds that I made. So, like, kick drums, snare drums, hi-hats, that kind of thing. So I don't have to repatch them every time I need that particular sound, because it is 
sort of a process, but I'll just go through how that works, uh, and then we'll, we'll take a listen. Um, so it's actually very similar to the crowd where we're actually going to use the clock um, output to the gate, um, but here I'm going to use MIDI to help me with the clock. It's just a little easier to use MIDI clock, in my opinion. So I'll turn it down, actually, so you don't get, like, constant beats. All right, so we're going to clock the uh, ADSR gate as our first step. I'm going to keep the dynamics low so we don't hear anything while that's going on because there's a, there's a little bit to patch up. Um, so the basis of the pitches, uh, is it going to be random? We don't want random pitches. We want a very defined curve to create these sort of like thwacks and thumps and, you know, basically short envelopes to create those sounds. So we're going to use the slope output of the slope circuit, go into the attenuated, uh, attenuverted input. And then we're going to take that and go into the volt per octave. So this is where we're going to get the pitches. And then we're going to take the, the copy of that output and go into the overtone circuit. And then, so it's important to note here, now we've got slope going to three different destinations, right? We have the normal connection to multiply. Then we have the, uh, the an attenuverted version going into both the volt per octave and the overtone. All right, so this little mixer section is very handy. Then I'm going to send the triangle into the FM. So this is similar to the previous patch. And we're going to send the square into the external input so that the fundamental is a square wave, which is going to be more useful for this sort of percussive sound. So instead of cycling the slope, we're actually going to use the just the one envelope the end of note and send that to the trigger input of the slope circuit, right? We don't want a super fast envelope. We want something that's sort of controlled, something that we can work with to create percussive sounds from. So we're just going to use the trigger input instead of the time input uh, and, and cycle the LFO. And then lastly, we're going to take the dynamics output and go into the balance um, circuit. So we're going to basically go between the square wave and the harmonics on top of the square wave. So that's the basic setup. Um, then from here, it's pretty precise in sort of the knobs uh, and how you want to set them. So we're going to actually turn the dynamics up so we can hear what it's going to sound like without before we make any adjustments. We get a sort of like click. That's because the pitch is very high. All right, so now we're going to make our adjustments. All right, so for the um, attenuator, attenuverter, we want this set to basically like 1 o'clock because we want small positive um, inputs going into the volt product. We're going to make, it, make a little basically a filter ping, sort of the same idea. Uh, overtone is about right at about 1. We want the modulation around noon. Again, here, this is an att attenuator, so anything greater than counterclockwise is giving modulation. We want the multiply up, and we want that attenuverter past noon. Um, FM is about right. We can set that to taste. And then the slope, we want short attack, long decay, and a quick exponential envelope. Lastly, we want to change the contour so that it's a lot faster. About medium sustain, medium decay, and a quick envelope. If all goes according to plan, there's one thing we have to do. We have to now set the MIDI note, because um, right now it's, it's too high. We're actually going to hit C0, and we get our kick drum. <laughs> 
turned down the reverb, I turned up the filter response, so it's giving a little more beef to the kick. And it's going to respond to clock. So the shorter the clock, the more you sort of get this decay stage. So you might want to decrease the fall. I'm sorry, we want to decrease the sustain. There we go. But increasing the clock just makes it sort of a four on the floor type of thing. So really the main driver is this slope circuit because this is shaping the pitch that we're hearing. The concert envelope is for basically just pinging the the slope. So the faster we are here, the, the quicker we can get to affecting the pitch. And then this is also affecting the dynamics. So a lot of stuff about envelopes. So using adjustments on the note that we're sending, we can change the sound. So if we go up to... We can get sort of a, a snare almost. And if we go higher, we get those pings. So you get a lot of you get a lot of different sounds by adjusting the envelope responses. And then the negative, if we go into the negative on the slope input, then it's going to sort of ramp upward. And then the harmonic, uh, the overtone and multiply sections supply that sort of base uh, to the signal, uh, which is why we're adding those modulations in just to fill it out a little bit more. We can also remove the gate and then just uh, make hits using uh, keys. So I'm going to make adjustments a little bit. All right, so from here, I'm just going to stop talking and explaining things and just start messing around with the rest of my setup. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know, leave a comment below. Um, I think this is a really cool device. There's a lot you can do with it. Um, the sort of main paradigms I can think of is a monophonic you know, bass synth. You can also do percussion. You can do uh, sort of faked uh, paraphony. 
I'm saying that wrong, but you can get multiple um, harmonies on top of your main uh, tones using the slope and contour. We showed one of those with the slope circuit. Um, you can really do a lot. It's 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 a like I said, it's a great entry point into the world of sim of modular synthesizer. It's a it's a good place to start because it gives you a normal setup, something that sounds good. It's easy to use, and then if you want to dive in, it it's got plenty of options. And I didn't even cover, you know, barely covered a, a scratch of the surface, um, but it gives you some ideas to work with. Um, so, thanks for watching. If you want to listen to the for, to the rest of this jam. Um, I'd be, I'd be very appreciated, but otherwise, uh, thanks a lot.